All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome. We are in the middle of our uh, amazing topic in class, trying to uh, find the deep wisdom of Shlomo HaMelech um, in his Sefer Mishle. Uh, hopefully, uh, tonight, we'll walk away with some new insights and pearls of wisdom that we could walk away with in our modern age and uh, be inspired to become greater, better human beings. So we're in Perik Gimel, the third Perik. Um, so he begins, let's just jump right in. He says, My sir, my child, um, my Torah, don't forget, my mitzvot, you should guard my commandments. Um, make sure you do everything you can to preserve the things that I've taught you. So Shlomo Melech was uh, not some, you know, average uh, Joe, uh, intellectual philosopher, thinker, he was very deep and profound. And therefore, when he says, whatever he says, it's very specific. So the theme of this particular chapter is, spends, he spends a lot of time dealing with the idea of improving your character traits, right? Tikon hamidot, you've heard that idea, right? Um, but, but what's unique about this chapter is that he goes beyond the idea of just trying to improve your character traits and he wants you to go beyond that and think about tikkun divrei hasechel, which is the um, rectification of uh, one's thinking. Like, well, well, okay, Rabbi, I get it. I understand the idea of you know fixing my character traits. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm impatient. I'm not kind enough. I'm not. I don't have enough gratitude. I get that. But like, what are you talking about? How does one go ahead and you know improve, refine your thinking, and why is that important? Well, our nature is to be selfish. Our nature is to be doubtful. Our nature, human, human nature, is that we trust in our own sechel, in our, in our own intelligence. We rely on our human intelligence, right? <clears throat> Hold on a second, just letting someone in. And um, while you know, we're able to correct our character traits uh, using our own uh, mind and thinking, if our intelligence is warped, if our thinking is uh, deficient, right? Um, if, our, if we don't have a proper uh, belief in God, um, we don't have proper trust and, and not in God, right? And we don't consider whatever the Torah has to say as being wise, then you're always gonna rebuke any kind of instruction. And uh, there's never gonna be any hope for any improvement. The idea of, of fixing or refining your thinking is the lens. It's the vehicle that allows you to become a greater human being. Everything goes after your thoughts. Those of you that have kids or young nephews, nieces know that some kids have a predisposition just to getting very angry, very upset because everything they see in their world is just coming from a very negative, self-centered, selfish lens. And as parents uh, or as niece, as a, as a, um, aunts and uncles, you know, uh, depending on your relationship with the kids, um, your responsibility is to say something. We don't allow a kid to live in a negative space. We obviously, you see someone who, who clearly made a mistake in their thinking, we tell them, hey, listen, you know, you are, you're thinking about this the whole, the completely wrong way. And here's another way of looking at it. Let's just twist the whole thing around for you. And that's exactly what he's talking about over here. So he's gonna give us some key points over here as to how, what we can do to help refine our thinking. It's so crucial because it, it is the vehicle, the lens in which we experience all of our experiences day in and day out. So therefore, if you're a negative person, everything you see is going to be negative. If you're a positive person, then you'll start being more positive about the things that you see. Um, so he says, Benit Torti al Tishkaf, my child, don't forget my Torah. He's speaking in God's name. King Solomon says, Israel, my people, you are dear to me as a child, as a child is to a parent. Therefore, I caution you, don't forget these ideas, okay? Right? Let your heart guard my commandments. A Jew is obligated <clears throat> to study Torah at all times. Now, it says in the Pasuk in Yoshua, Vihigat Vihigita Bo Yama Valaila, Yamam Valaila. You should contemplate it day and night. Okay, the verse doesn't say don't forget at any time. 
the first says you got to constantly be aware of it. How do you, why is that so important? <clears throat> why is it so important to be um, methodically, <clears throat> excuse me, invested in continuously finding a way to bring these ideas into your life? Well, think of it like this. We're always distracted and we understand distraction better than any generation before us. We are super distracted. I got things beeping around me. I have lights flashing at me. Even as now I'm using my phone and my computer, I have little things popping up on the sides and, and I got little boxes of people on my screen everywhere over here. You know, I don't even know where to look anymore. I, am I looking at the camera? Am I looking at the people? Here, someone just came in, let's admit them into the room. Like it's just, it's nonstop distraction, 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 right? <clears throat> so how do you find a, uh, a sense of normalcy? How do we create a place of balance where we can create a real environment for development and growth? We, we all agree. I don't think we have to do a poll right now. I think we all agree that we're much more effective and productive when we're not distracted, when we could focus on one thing and build on that. I don't think anyone has any problems with that, right? <clears throat> so let me say it like this. Do you think that people were less distracted 100 years ago? Do you think people were less distracted 500 years ago? Do you think people were less distracted 1,000 years ago? Now, I'm going to say something that's going to sound crazy, and I'm willing to take pushback for this, but I have a suspicion that people were just as distracted 100 years ago and 500 years ago. Their distractions were just a little different than ours. They were distracted with, oh my God, where's my, where am I going to get my next meal? I'm starving. There was no pantry. There was no grocery store. There was no like, you know, uh, yeah. there was no chesed organization that was out there giving out food to people. People were starving and people died of them just being hungry. They had other distractions, but people were just as distracted. And when we, when we go ahead and solve one level of distraction, and therefore we got rid of the, you know, most people in America are, uh, are satiated, they're, they're full, uh, no one's worrying about food, no one's worrying about shelter today, most people have shelter, anyone who wants food and shelter has it today. But that was certainly a distraction 100 years ago, 500, year, 500 years ago, and 1000 years ago, and 2000 years ago. So I'm going to argue that everyone's always distracted in every generation. Our distractions are a little bit easier to deal with because all I got to do is literally turn off my phone and I'm not distracted, right? All I got to do is turn off my computer or put it in another room and I'm not distracted. So what is the system for success? Okay, there's a couple of things. There's an ancient um, Roman proverb that says that you can never step into the same river twice, right? And therefore, when you're walking and stepping your foot, you're putting your foot into that river, the water is always flowing. The next time you want to put your foot there, the whole, all the water that's there is all completely different. Number one of success, the, one number, the first step of success is recognizing that time is always moving. And that if you are not making use of your time right now, my friends, you are in trouble. Okay, so you got to figure out a way of, of, of respecting your time. You have to figure out a way of recognizing that time is super important. Now, having said that, so the wise men of um, the Jewish men of hyper intelligence and, and brilliance set up a system that says like this, and this is this is coming from Joshua himself. He says, bo yamam valayla. If you want success in anything, you got to be consistently dedicated to it. You got to always find a way to be thinking about how you're connecting, growing, developing that idea. This is true in business. This is true in family relationships. This is true with spouses. If you're not obsessing about whatever it is that you want to accomplish, it's gonna be very hard to accomplish because we're always distracted and it's impossible to always beat the distraction game. We could create moments of space and time where we're not distracted, right? Which is why Shabbat is so important today. The idea of just having the 25 hours of complete cessation of all flashy, beepy, you know, uh, gimmicky kind of things that are always you know, drawing our attention away from the world that we're meant to be working on. And therefore, the rabbis will tell you things that, you know, that says that you've got to do things throughout your whole entire day that keeps you focused. The focus of everything that we do is based around God. Why? 
Not because, again, Jews don't have a, um, a Christian conception of God. We don't think of God as being the angry guy in the sky with lightning bolts and his bag of all kinds of plagues ready to shower them on you for doing all your sins. That's not our conception of God. Our vision of what God is, is a loving father who will often give us tough love. Uh, he'll create uh, difficulties for us so that we can overcome them and grow. That real life, life's greatness comes from overcoming challenge. And that when we live in a world of comfort, that's weakness. Weakness is comfort. You have to remember that. If you think about that, I mean, that, 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 those words alone should just be like, you should write that down on your wall. <clears throat> comfort is weakness. Think about that for a moment. When we grow into becoming the better versions of ourselves, it comes from being uncomfortable. If you're too comfortable doing whatever you're doing, you're doing something wrong. If you're on a treadmill and you're feeling comfortable right now, you're doing something wrong, all right? If you're in the weight room and you're like, oh, this is great, I love this, this is amazing. If you're not grunting, screaming, and sweating, you're doing something wrong. Comfort is bad. When you're uncomfortable, that level of uncomfortability or of, 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 of lack of comfort is where your growth and greatness comes from. <clears throat> when you are putting yourself into a place where you got to sweat and work hard, that is where you're making, that's where greatness comes from. That is where the awesomest, most amazing part of your essence and being comes from. Comfort, yeah, I'm not saying you shouldn't be comfortable. Find your moments to enjoy comfort but our default setting should not be comfort. There's a, uh, a famous, uh, famous guy from uh, the Netherlands, his name is Wim Hof. Wim Hof created something called the Wim Hof Method. He's, he made the whole idea of taking cold showers uh, very uh, uh, modern and fashionable. And he has this great line. He says that, you know, when we think about cardiovascular diseases, and I'm not a doctor, I'm just telling you what he says. It just makes sense to me. If I'm, he's wrong and you're a doctor, I apologize. Um, but um, you know, he said that when you think of the cardiovascular system, the cardiovascular system is not just the heart. It's all the nerve endings in your body. And since the body itself is always looking to find comfort, right? Um, when you are clothed and you're always in an ideal environment, your muscles and your cardiovascular system and the little nerve endings in your finger, your skin, it begins to atrophy and die. It's only through extreme temperatures that the muscles of the cardiovascular system actually are developed. And therefore he recommends that you should take a two minute cold shower every single day. Start with, for, start with 30 seconds and then go to 35 seconds and, and go up to two minutes. But whenever you shower, three to four times a week, I hope at the very least, um, you know, take a cold shower and you'll see that it'll completely revitalize your whole entire um, cardiovascular system. When the cardiovascular system that is there in your nerve endings and your skin and, and throughout your whole entire body are, are atrophying, it put, puts more pressure on the heart and therefore you're more prone to heart disease. But if everything around you, your whole system is working perfectly in sync, that puts less stress on the heart and you'll see your actually your heart rate your daily resting rate will go down. I know that because I actually measure it on my watch, believe it or not, and I'm very aware of wherever my heart is. I'm just curious to figure, figure out that stuff. So therefore, King Solomon is telling you over here, my son, be aware, recognize. My commandments are there to help you focus on the idea that there's a God. Why? because the idea that there's a God means that there, I have a responsibility. I can't just do whatever I want. I have a responsibility that's something bigger than just me. If it's just me, if it's just doing whatever I want, I'm not gonna do anything. I'm just gonna look for comfort. Um, I mentioned this, um, I think a couple of weeks ago that Japan does a, uh, is the only country in the world that I'm, I'm aware of that does a monthly report of their suicide rate, okay? Um, every other country does it at the end of the year. Now, in, for November in Japan, they had more people dying from a suicide than from COVID-19 in the month of November. That's insane. That's crazy. 
Now, Japan is an amazing country. It's very modern, very intelligent people, hardworking people, very spirit, they're good people. So how, what happens to a society when society becomes totally focused on your luxury and comforts? There's no more meaning left. You're done. In America, if you're a white male and you're over the age of 35, you have a 35% higher chance of committing suicide. <laughs> Why? Well, I would imagine there's a correlation between belief in God and suicide rates. And those people that have no belief in God, if you're an atheist, it's easier for you to go ahead and say, well, why should I do this? If I'm gonna live my life, I'm gonna go out as a Spartan when I'm 35, my oh my glory, and I'm gonna party it out really hard and that's when I'm just gonna end it myself, my way. I don't wanna get sick, I don't wanna see any diminishing of my powers and I'm gonna go out like a jam. That is a super narcissistic, hedonistic, Roman Greek way of thinking of life. It's part of what the Maccabees were fighting against. But he says over here, King Solomon, in the next verse is, Ki orach yamim ushenot chayim v'shalom yasifulach. Right? If you are, uh, they add to the length of days and the years of your life and peace. The idea of believing in God, following the commandments, they actually add to your life. The commandments are there. So they will give you the ability to develop your years of life and health. Why? Because you're not stressing out about anything. I'm doing my part. In Judaism, how do we measure success? What's the measure of success in Judaism? Is it measured by how much money you make? Is it measured by how many verses of the Torah you know by heart? The answer is no and no. The way we measure success in Judaism is by your effort how much you are trying. And some of us have to put in more effort than others. And therefore, those people that have to work harder, you're getting much more reward. The people that where everything comes super easy to them, they have to work so much more harder. They have to put in so much more effort and work to be able to get the reward that you get from the little amount of effort you're putting in because it's so hard for you. <laughs> He says, kindness and truth should not forsake you. Hold on to them. Don't let them, for, don't, don't, don't let them forsake you. Now, <clears throat> this is where King Solomon starts to spelling, spelling out the spiritual uh, prescription to serving God. First, you got to begin with kindness. Okay? Pasuk says in Tehilim, Olam Chesed Hashem Yibaneh. God creates the world. His creation was an act of kindness. And therefore, when we act with kindness, we are emulating God. The second thing he says, you got to live a life of truth. Serve God with kindness and truth. Chesed includes noble character traits and emet includes the intellect. So let's break it down. Chesed. What is chesed? According to King Solomon here, it is the desire to help others, whether it's monetary, monetary, monetary help, physically exerting oneself on their behalf, or, you know, and to, to avoid uh, hurting other people. It is the concrete expression of a desire to being, to bring pleasure in deed or speech to other people. Chesed, right, prescribes traits such as, you know, um, cruelty, stinginess, hatred, and jealousy. You can't have chesed and have those traits. Everyone, even a person of limited means, can easily form acts of chesed. It's so easy. All you got to do is be aware of somebody else's wants and needs and then go ahead and, and give them. <laughs> chesed includes not only charity, but visiting the sick, um, comforting mourners, encouraging the people that are uh, feeling down right now, right? Being the eyes to the blind and the feet to the lame, doing whatever you can to go ahead and um, give comfort to the people around you right? Truth. What is truth? Truth is not praising what is wrong and not denigrating what is good, not flattering, um, you know, uh, those people that are dishonest. It's about rejoicing in the honor of the righteous and the, and, and the downfall of the wicked, right? It includes the pursuit of truth, of, of judging others honestly, 
of avoiding favoritism, of admitting that one has made a mistake. One should always be concerned not to lead a, uh, to be led astray emotionally by false ideas and premises. And therefore truth is all about allowing yourself to overcome your emotions, create a framework in which you're going to live by and allow that framework to dictate your life not to be moved because you're feeling down right now. Oh, you know, you said something that made me feel bad and therefore I'm gonna do this to you right now. Emmet is so beloved by God, by Hashem, a person has to strive for it and bring it to every aspect of his life beyond the literal demand of the law. For instance, Emmet truth dictates that one honor not only the verbal commitments, but even those that he only had thought about in his heart. You thought about doing something, you should honor those things. That's Rabbi Yonah. He takes it that far. The Vilna Gaon, the Vilna of uh, Gaon, of uh, uh, the Gaon of Vilna, right? Rabbi Eliyahu Kramer says that Chesed and Emet, he says a little bit differently. This is what he says. He says that in when it comes to interpersonal relationships, any good is done voluntarily, great or small, is Chesed. Whatever you do, that's Chesed. Whereas Emet, truth, is what someone does to repay the chesed, okay? So therefore, emet must be um, in sync with kindness because you're paying it. And a small gesture of gratitude for a great favor is never, is, is always inadequate. In man's conduct towards God, the concept of chesed and emet apply as well. So to dedicate yourself to Torah study is emet. Why? Because when you're commanded to do so. And therefore, you're doing chesed, you're doing emet. To teach others is chesed. So you have these two different views over here, which we're going to come down. I'm going to break it down into, into a uh, different parts based on the Rabbeinu Yona, if we have time for it tonight. So he goes as follows. He says, the verse continues. He says, ukishram al gargorotecha. Bind them on your neck. Okay, what's he talking about, King Solomon? He says, bind them on your neck. He says, when you're speaking constantly about chesed and emet, it enhances your prestige, right? Like a beautiful necklace around your neck, right? If you're someone who's always looking to be living in a world of truth and kindness, by the way, I'm gonna say to live in a world of truth and kindness is uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to always be aware of other people's needs and, and not think, well, what are they doing for me in return? It's always difficult to be thinking about how I could help other people when you feel like, why should I do this? Like, it's not my responsibility. They should take care of themselves, right? It's uncomfortable to think of chesed. It's uncomfortable to think of truth. I'm not saying you're lying, but that, that's not how we're, we're not defining truth as, 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 a, as just being truthful. We're defining truth as being truthful to your beliefs, being truthful to your word. Of, of, of carrying out, you know, a, a clear prescription of where you are using your intellect to make decisions over your emotions. That's what it means to be truthful. To be truthful means that I know I need to get up and at seven o'clock, I need to be at, at, uh, at my, uh, my first shachrit, at my, my first minyan, my first prayer service. And uh, I have no excuse why I'm being late. It means being truthful to that idea, being truthful to the idea of making a blessing, being truthful to the ideas of Shabbat, being truthful to those things. And that's why he says, he moves on, he says, inscribe them on the tablet of your heart. Concentrate your thoughts on the traits so you could devise a way of implementing them. Now, chesed as acts of kindness and, and, and emet as the study of Torah, is how the al Sheikh defines chesed. Chesed is acts of kindness, and emet over here is the study of Torah based on King Solomon's uh, wording. Now, why are we combining Torah with chesed? <laughs> why is that so important? It's interesting, there's a famous uh, exchange at the end of the Gemara in uh, Masechtot uh, Sanhedrin. It's on, um, it's on Sadiq, on Kuf Yud Aleph, where the students of Rabbi Eliezer um, speak to him and say, Rabbi, what's going to happen before the Messianic era? What could we do to protect ourselves? What should we do to save ourselves from the big final, you know, redemption? 
So he says, my students, he's like, there's only two things you can do. Only two things you can do. Are you guys ready? These are the two things. And I really believe we're living in this generation. These are the two things that we need to do in our generation. And this is exactly what King Solomon is saying over here. He's saying chesed and Torah. The only two things you could do is gemilat chasadim, is the act of kindness. And number two is learning Torah. So good news is tonight you're learning Torah. So boom, you're doing one out of the two. Good going. Okay. Now, what do you, how do you go ahead and do chesed? Okay, Rabbi, great. I'm going to my classes. I'm learning my Torah. I come every Wednesday. You know, today's what? Today's Tuesday, Monday night, Monday night, Monday night at six o'clock. I'm listening to Rabbi Ruane's class. We're learning King Psalm together and it's amazing. Um, You know, uh, and I'm doing that. Check. Okay. Well, how do I do chesed? What does that mean? That can mean lots of things. Doing chesed can mean um, writing out a check. Doing chesed can mean checking on your neighbor. Doing chesed, I'm gonna say this, I hope my mom's not watching. It can mean even calling your mom and it really in, mo- in, in, in the most busiest part of your day and saying, you know what, I'm gonna to try to call her and make her feel good right now, even though I don't need to call her because I called her in the morning already. And I called her last night and an hour before, but I'm gonna call her because I wanna just check in and just make her feel good. Or it's send an email to someone we haven't spoken to in a long time saying, hey, how are you doing? It's the little things that we do. Just, it's the awareness of chesed that we need to be aware of. Gemilat chasadim literally means gomel dalim. If you look at the, the letters in the alphabet, aleph, bet, gimel, dalet, right? So gimel in the Hebrew alphabet is written with its legs sticking out on the bottom, okay? And therefore the gimel is always running after the dalet. The gimel represents, go, represents chesed, gomel chasadim. He's always looking to run and give to the dalet. The Dalit always represent Dalim, the poor people, the people that are unfortunate, the people that are stuck, the people that are two intersecting lines going nowhere and um, they just, they're depressed. The Gimel is always running after the Dalit. So how do you become someone who's involved in Chesed? You're always looking for opportunities to do Chesed. Now, that's not gonna turn on tomorrow. It's not gonna turn on once you listen to put this, I'm gonna listen to this class a thousand times, that's not gonna change you. It comes from the consistent, deliberate effort in trying to be aware of chesed, period. That's it. We live in a generation that is so narcissistic. You look back at, you know, I I posted this video last week. I'll I'll share it with the group if you want. Um, A a, a video that was made of uh, just looking at someone who was born in, in the year 1900. When he was 14 years old, he went through World War One. You know, when he was, um, you know, six years later, um, you know, uh, world, you know, less than that, like five years later, there's the Spanish flu, uh, and you know, and 15 million, you know, was it 10 million people die, and then six years later is World War Two. Okay, uh, at the end of World War Two, uh, you go to Vietnam, and like you just like you have a guy by the time he's 60. Okay. In his 60s, he's witnessed two world wars, okay, a pandemic, okay, new wars, new, you know, all kinds of revolutions happening around the world. And he's the happiest guy in the world, right? And here we are, we're living um, in a a time where we're uncomfortable because we got to wear these things everywhere we go and it's horrible. Oh my God, the pain. Right, it's so bad. I gotta wear this thing, and my lip sweats, and I gotta. And I'm uncomfortable, and I can't breathe properly, and I can't do it anymore. I just want to be mask free. That lack of grit comes from just not having gratitude. We lack resilience because we're ungrateful, and the more gratitude, the more grateful we are, the more resilient we become. And it, it kind of goes back, I think of this in the strangest way, like taking a cold shower is a physical way of appreciating having warm water. <laughs> and it's in that space where you have that contrast that you actually grow your muscles. It's where we develop, it's where we become bigger. How do you write something on your heart, inscribe them on your tablet? Okay, you gotta be repetitive. The heart is a machine that does exactly the same thing over and over again. It's beeping and beeping and pumping and pumping and pumping and 
inscribing on your heart? Why don't I inscribe it on my soul? Why don't he tell me to inscribe it on my forehead <laughs> or inscribe it on my wrist? Inscribe it on your heart because the way you make things real to you, the way you get them to become part of your essence and your being is by having those small beats over and over and over again, that consistent beat of the drum, non-stop. Remember, you're not a narcissistic animal. Remember, you have the power of, of being grateful. Remember that you could go ahead and be involved in helping the world around you. And we have so much luxury. We're amazing. To the point where the luxury itself is making us weak and killing us. Right? We don't exercise enough. We're not putting any effort. I don't have to go shopping for food anymore. Can you imagine if I told my great, 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 great grandfather, great, great, great grandpa, you want to eat? No problem. Hold on a second. Let me pull out the small little device in my pocket, push a couple of buttons, and in 30 minutes, some guy will be standing outside my door with hot food prepared for me. That's insane. It's crazy. Do we feel grateful? When the delivery guy comes and brings his food, that basket of food to our house, or are we frustrated that he came 10 minutes later than he said that he was going to be? I can't believe you said 30 minutes. It was 45 minutes. This food isn't warm enough for me. How could they not bring me the napkins? Where are my little, you know, my condiments? I need my ketchup. They forgot it. You just sat in your house from the luxury of your living room chair and had food delivered to your house and you're complaining? Wow. <laughs> you got it all wrong. King Solomon says, you have to be aware that kindness and truth, okay? The idea of learning Torah is the idea of recognizing that we have a responsibility to think and grow, to refine our character traits, to refine our thinking. How do you do that? Write it on your heart. There is a, um, this idea of, uh, of combining Torah with chesed, right? This is what Rabbi Eliezer said. You got to do chesed and Torah. You can't do one. You got to do both, right? It's a famous story in the Talmud where Abaye and Rava, who were the, the, who were the descendants of Eli HaKohen, the Kohen Gadol, right? If, you're, if you know any Tawils, right, as a last name, believe it or not, Tawil in Arabic means have a long life. Tawils are usually Kohanim. They're priests, and they're priests that are descendants from Eli HaKohen. And Eli HaKohen's descendants were cursed, to live a short life. Um, and therefore they change the last name as a reminder that you know, they should be blessed with long life, the counter react, the curse of a short life, right? So what was, uh, why was, why did God decree that their male offspring would not live long? Why? Because Rava, whose greatness in Torah study merited an additional 25, 20 years of life. Abaye, who was also great in chesed, was granted uh, 40 years of extra years of life. And therefore, these two people who should have died at a young age live a longer lives because of their dedication to Torah and Gemil Chesedim. Another key to long life comes from the word, um, bind them on your neck, right? The teacher, and how do you do that? How do you bind something on your neck? Teach it to other people. When you become a teacher to others, you're also growing your life in that way. Um, let's let's do this. We'll do one more, and what we'll call we'll call it a night. Next pasuk says, <laughs> "You'll find favor and good goodly God goodly sense in the eyes of God and man." Now, a kind person, I get that, right? A kind person will find favor in both God and man. Whoever is merciful to others is the recipient of you know God, godly mercy. Uh, and his kindness is endears him to the people around him. And one who practices truth will find a, a goodly sense in the in the eyes of both God and man, right? Why? By you're vindicating uh, the righteous and condemning the wicked. That's how he displays goodness. Now, the Vilna Gaon says the word chen, favor, comes from the word chinam. Chinam means free or undeserved. Why? Because Favor does not need to be related to one's actions. That's why the scripture always speaks about a finding favor in the phrase, if I have found favor, right? So when the Vilna Gaon hears the word sechel, 
right? Uh, he, he translated it as success, right? Um, as maskil. Now, when you're performing chesed, an undeserved act of kindness, you are going to be rewarded with chen, an undeserved favor. As a reward for the emet, you're going to be granted success. So let's go back again. My rabbi taught me this hack. Okay, this is a, this is a spiritual life hack, but be careful how you use it. It's very potent. Instead of being focused on your wants and your needs, focus first on the wants and the needs of the people around you, and you'll find yourself consistently being blessed with getting the things that you need first. That's not why you should be doing it. You should be motivated because you just want to be there to help the people around you. But like this pasuk says over here, okay, involve yourself in doing good things for other people, and you, your focus, you will see the boomerang effect, you will be rewarded first, okay? Therefore, the chachamim infer from this first that you have to behave in a way that is pleasing to people and not only to people, but also to God. Therefore, a, the Kohen who took money to purchase animals for offerings wore the clothing without pockets so that he could not be suspected of stealing. He was super focused on doing exactly what he has to do. So there, how do you do that? It's very simple. Boteach el Hashem b'chol libecha ve'el binotecha al tisha'en. Trust in God with all your heart and don't rely upon your own understanding. You gotta let go a little bit. Let go and let God. Let Remember that as much as we understand as we could try to understand in this world that we're in, we are still very much flawed. Why? Because I have a body that has its own wants and needs and I'm distracted by my own wants and needs. And therefore, King Solomon tells you this follows. He says, trust in God and spend as much as necessary to engage in the teacher. Don't depend exclusively on your own understanding. This trait is personified by Hillel the elder who gave away half of his minimum daily wage to pay an entry fee into the study hall. He did everything he could to figure out a way of trusting in God, investing in his own development. Don't assume I'm going to succeed since I acted intelligently, right? I can't tell you how many people who are the most brilliant stockbrokers with every single, you know, um, monetary, um, you know, uh, possibility thought through uh, have lost billions of dollars, millions and millions and millions of dollars. Okay, now if you trust in God, don't, don't rely on your own, your own understanding. You have to do your part and then let go and remember that God's in control. One who relies on his own prowess and believes that everything is from him, they forfeit divine assistance. They forfeit God's ability to go ahead and help them get divine assistance to accomplish their own things. So King Solomon's telling you like this. He says, you gotta learn to trust in God. How do you trust in God? That doesn't mean you don't act. It doesn't mean that you don't put in your effort and your energy. It means the opposite. It means you put in your effort and energy, but the outcome is not up to you. I can't control the outcome. I do my part. I play my role. I do the good. I live a life of emet. I live a life of chesed. I, I live a life where I'm, going, I'm constantly focused and aware of what I need to be doing, caring for the world around me and caring for my own spiritual development. And once I've done those two things, I got to let God do his part. I can't control the rest. I got to be in the right place at the right time. I can't be sitting on my couch doing nothing. I need to be involved in doing what is right, but the outcome is not up to me. Sometimes God says, not now. Sometimes God says, no, I don't give up. I never give up. Abraham was promised a huge amount of real estate in Israel, and he had nowhere to bury his wife. He was promised to have a massive amount of offspring that will populate the earth like the, like the stars in the heavens and the sands on the beach, and he had no offspring. He had a son who was 37 years old still living at home, right? Nothing. What does he do? He pays and buys a burial plot for his wife, and he hires a matchmaker for his son. Things don't go your way. You got to get up and make it go your way. God wants you to put in the effort. He wants you to try harder. Don't allow yourselves to be lost in a world of comfort. Remember that yesterday's luxuries become today's necessities. I'm not saying you should enjoy luxury. I'm not saying you shouldn't have comforts. 
have them, but don't allow them to weaken you. Don't allow them to distort what it is that you are. You, my friends, are an infinite being with infinite amount of potential. And the only thing that's holding you back from you accessing that power, that energy, the only stumbling block there is you. You're your worst enemy. If you believed in who you are, if you believed in what you could do, you, would ne- you wouldn't be able to sleep at night. You'd be awake all night thinking about how can I help all the people around me? How could I, how, how could I? But instead you go to bed thinking about yourselves. This is a time of darkness in the world. This is a time where people need people, good people. Live a life of Ahmed, live a life of Chesed, and you will be blessed with all the blessings of King Solomon. We're looking forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you, Rabbi. Pleasure, pleasure. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah to you. That's right, happy Hanukkah. Hanukkah is Thursday night, sunset. Those of you that are able to come by on, on Wednesday night at the synagogue at 7.30, we're going to be holding classes in person and, and streaming live as well. You're welcome to join us here or watch us uh, post it around. Uh, you're welcome to uh, join us wherever you're most comfortable. Thank you so much for coming and uh, have a happy time and a great week, everybody. Bye.